So next, we're going to begin the uh, conversations, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, John to interview, introduce Jennifer and Paul. Jennifer Please, and Paul, come on Jennifer and down. Paul, come up to the so, stage. Jennifer Palka is the founder and executive director of Code for America, and has uh, wherever you want, wherever you like, madam, um, and and been involved and active with the News Challenge from, for several years. Paul Steiger was, among the things that were created in 2007 was ProPublica, one of the most important new initiatives in journalism of the last 10 years. Paul was, is the founder and also happens to be one of my bosses at Knight Foundation as a trustee. <laughs> so we're really excited to have the two of you. I guess I'm gonna awkwardly shift and come over here. But, um, <laughs> Did you want to be in the middle and I took your chair? Yeah, Sorry. that's okay. I'm just going to come off to the side so you guys can talk because this is really about. No, no, I, the you're making us feel uncomfortable. Come back. All right. All right. Fine. <laughs> um, so, where should we start? So, Paul, what were you thinking in 2007 when you started this crazy idea of a nonprofit national journalism project? And how do you think it's grown in the last 10 years? And, and how does it fit in with where we are today? Well, um, Thinking is, is too soft a word. I was praying it would work. Um, uh, and um, I, you know, those of you who know what um, ProPublica is, it's a nonprofit investigative um, reporting team. And um, uh, we came into existence because of um, uh, what the other Jennifer alluded to a few minutes ago, that the downside of the internet which is that it completely destroyed the business model of um, uh, journalism, particularly newspapers, and um, uh, created a um, need for all kinds of remedial um, efforts uh, to uh, restore some of the balance, um, one of which was to mobilize technology, which has been, I think, a revolution in journalism that's happened over the over the last ten years, and that's um, uh, been possible um, because of all these developments. Some of them funded by Knight um, uh, in in the uh, tech world, um, and uh, the particular focus we had was investigative reporting because it was the one that was most hammered by the destruction of the old business model. The other, which, we, which somebody else will have to come along to do, is international reporting, which was also um, uh, hammered. But it's been an extremely exciting 10 years um, uh, for us, and um, uh, I'm thrilled at what's uh, happened so far, and my successors have taken over running things, doing it much better than I could have done, and, and I'm eagerly anticipating what they're gonna do next. So, Jen, I mean, sort of Code for America arose at this time as journalism, especially local journalism, was shrinking. How much has that driven the work you all have done, especially around open data and pushing out information in, in a way that's kind of untraditional for the way we would think about it from a journalism background? Yeah, I, um, we were just comparing notes about 2007, by the way. You forgot to mention the time that you took off to watch your football games. Oh, well, that's true. Between <laughs> um, uh, the Wall Street Journal. January 1st and 2nd, um, but then January 3rd we started. But, uh, I was trying to figure out what, you know, what the roots of um, open data were in 2007. I was really thinking about, you know, I guess it was, you know, when did Barack Obama announced his candidacy, because in 2007, I was all wrapped up in the world of Web 2.0. That's what I was doing, I was running this event that was all about, it was very optimistic times, um, all about the web coming back as this sort of participatory medium and all about what government data was gonna do for us. And it was uh, that moment when we had the Sunlight Foundation people come to Web 2.0 and we had this room set aside for Web 2.0 developers to work on uh, state data, I think it was that year. I think that was 2007. I'm trying to get my um, my, uh, my 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 years right. Um, but uh, yeah, I remember it as the year of the iPhone and sort of the, the for me sort of the dawning of the realization that government was going to be a player in this uh, and that world of tech, media, journalism, and that government was sort of now a player in it by the um, be, because they were bringing all this data together um, and. 
it was, I think, one of the first times I think people in the Valley started paying attention to government and that sort of triad uh, and saying, hey, there's really something interesting here. And I think it changed the kind of the relationship. And one of the things we were talking about before was um, when government comes to the, to the table with data, it's not that actor in the room that we're trying to hold accountable as much. It's actually at the table with something good. And we think about it differently than when we are investigating uh, malfeasance of some sort. Uh, it's, it's actually playing with us in that way. And I think that was sort of start, what started to happen in 2007, 2008. We, um, we decided to do Gov 2.0, I think, in 2008, which was the first time we said, how do you apply the principles and values of the participatory web to not just the business of getting a new guy elected, but actually a job of governing. And I think that actually launched in 2009. So it was sort of this gradual, um, for me, awareness of, of a world that I didn't know coming more from, for the, tech, from the tech space. Um, and it's, it's a little daunting to look back at how positive we were then, how much we thought open data would change the world, and how much we thought this was a way that government would always be coming to the table in a, in a more constructive way. Yeah, and I, you know, and I, I think that, that you know, you have um, uh, a marvelous list of some of the uh, great things that governments, you know, um, brought to the table. Um, I've heard you talk about um, uh, uh, geopositioning satellites, which, mm -hmm. you know, think of everything that's, you know, that's hooked to that. That's um, how I've, uh, I'm a New Yorker, but I wanted to check which subway route was better, and the, you know, geopositioning Satellites help me to, to uh, do that. The weather reports, you know, all are based on um, uh, government data. But there also are fundamental problems with the way the government tries to use that data, and and um, the the challenge of getting bureaucracy to deliver it in its best form. I mean, the the one of the reasons that one could argue one of the reasons that the um, Affordable Care Act, you know, got such a bad reputation was that they didn't wheel out. It might have been an impossible task, but they did not wheel out the um, uh, the program that would allow you to sign up in a way that um, people yep. could deal with it. The website didn't work when it launched. <laughs> yeah, right. It did Thank later you. work. And it's, good, it's a good remind us that it did end up working really well, and we signed up more people than we originally thought we could before it even failed. But it, it, it was yet another just sort of punch in the gut of, yeah, if government can't do digital, then it really can't implement its policies. And I do think of that as a particularly a watershed moment um, and in a very practical sense, it was a watershed moment mm -hmm. for a whole sort of, I guess, you know, later step in this story, which is the creation of the United States Digital Service and the Technology Transformation Service, which are, you know, going to be part of this story as we look at the next 10 years. Those things really wouldn't have happened. Um, I was trying to make them happen, and I absolutely would have failed. I was in the process of failing at doing them until healthcare.gov had such a rocky start, because then, then it was like, oh, right, like you can't spend all of this time, all of your political will getting this thing passed, and then have it fail because you, you, you can't use the internet, right? You can't make a website that works. Tr truth is, you can. And uh, you said, it was it an impossible task? No, not an impossible task. Absolutely not an impossible task. Um, but it's, uh, but hard in, in a government in the, context. And in the time frame. Um, yeah. I want to drill down on some of your lessons from that, especially in terms of the local work. But first, yep. I want to remind you all and folks, or tell you all and the folks watching, um, any questions you have for this dynamic duo, if you ask them at, if you use hashtag news challenge, uh, I will peel some out and ask that. And I, okay. And then, so before I ask you guys about local and the lessons from healthcare.gov and local, I, I'm just going to connect from a, in terms of Knight Foundation history, one, I would say in 2007, that first set of grants we announced, one of them was to Every Block, which you remember yes. very well, mm -hmm. which I think really got the ball going with a lot of these sort of civic data government conversations. And Paul Smith, who was on the technical team at Every Block, of course, was on the rescue team that came in and worked with healthcare.gov. So just um, 
linking this a Knight Foundation uh, historical footnote. But can you guys talk? And I mean, Paul Smith now works with Dan O'Neill, who is at Every Block, at Ad Hoc, one of the new vendors. And Dan O'Neill is the one who taught. Well, Dan O'Neill and Max Ogden are the ones that taught us how to get data out of governments. This combination of being nice and being mean. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I just had to throw right? in more history there. <laughs> combination of being nice and being so. How does the combination of nice and mean work differently at the local level? I mean, you, ProPublica's rolled out in Illinois its first sort of local initiative. I know that the brigades and everything you guys have learned that you learned when you were in Washington is now being rolled out locally. Well, how does this? I mean, the example of nice and nice and mean. Um, uh, this is be way before our Illinois project. Um, this was our nursing homes project. And it's a, it's a perfect example of what's good and bad with government data. Government collects everything you can imagine about practically every nursing home in America. Um, uh, you know, how many beds do they have? Um, how many stories? Um, uh, what zip codes are around it. Um, uh, and they also include things like um, how many um, uh, patients escaped, how many patients escaped and died, um, uh, how many um, failed tests there were. But if you try to go in and pull that stuff out, you can't do it because the interface sucks so bad that um, uh, Max and Dan O'Neill didn't fix that yet. What, um, what's wrong with you guys? Uh, but it, it. it provided a great opportunity for ProPublica because what we did was we said, we, I mean, my colleagues who can do this stuff, um, uh, said, look, we can write code that will allow you to easily extract which nursing homes are um, uh, the best and which are the worst and where they're located, and um, uh, and it, you know an ordinary human being can do this, and then we said, okay, this is fine. We put up the the big database, and we update it every quarter, which is when the government up, updates it, but but we said this would be great for local TV stations because when there's new info that comes down, we can give that to them, and it's, it's something other than shootings and fires that they can put up on the, uh, on the evening news that has re, you know, real relevance to their community. Which, are, which nursing homes are doing great, and we can interview them, or which nursing homes um, should be in jail, and we can do interviews um, with them and, and say, oh yes, you might want to go to this um, uh, website and and you can look for your look for yourself so that's that's the combination they have great data they collect everything but um, uh, they're a little nervous about making it easy to offend people yeah because they've been burned yeah <laughs> so often yeah, right yeah we were I was just on the phone with uh, John Wonderlick at Sunlight uh, talking about um, I asked him first sort of what's what's his story he wants to talk about at our summit, our Cook America Summit in, in, um, in May. And he said New Orleans, and it was just funny, because you know I think uh, we did a project on blight in New Orleans back in 2012. And it's the same example. I mean, it's easier, I think, to get data at the local level if you are persistent, because it's very, though you're right, they do collect a lot of data. It's, you know, I think when I got in this field, I kind of had, my, my vision of it is like, you get a data set and you do something with the data set. And it's not that. It's like a dozen data sets, or like three dozen data sets mm -hmm. in different formats that don't, where the fields don't match up. I mean, it's just, it's, it, it turned out to be a lot more complicated. But when people care, right? If people mm -hmm. care, if you have elderly people in your family, you may really care about the nursing home care. In, in New Orleans, people really cared about the blight status. So it was worth it to sort of persevere through the complexities, um, both technical and, of course, really human to make that data available to the people in New Orleans. So this was a project we did called Blight Status, um, where previously really the only way you could understand the status of a blighted property in New Orleans was once a month when each individual data owner was sitting at a very long table. It's the only, data, only human data integration when they're all at the same table. Um, and you know, it's just interesting to think that you know, that project is still 
having a deeper and deeper impact in government operations uh, you know, in 2017, where it's not just about getting that data out to the public, but it's also about improving government because they have access to that data. Uh, you know, I, and, and I mean, one of the things that has impressed me about what, you, what you've done in some of your various uh, incarnations is sort of breaking down the walls between the bureaucrats and, and the public, um, you know, using um, homely things like possums and fire hydrants and that kind of thing to, to get people to see that um, if they step up, I've, you, you have a wonderful for, for great phrase that I've forgotten, but it's, you know, don't complain, lend a hand. It's more felicitous than that. I think we've said a lot of different ways. Some people say, raise your hand before you point your finger. <laughs> yeah. Great. Um, but, but that makes people feel like they can make a difference using these, these, these things. Um, uh, you know, you, um, uh, in, in um, a place like Boston that occasionally has 12-foot snowfalls, you mm -hmm. um, have people adopt uh, a, a fire hydrant. And if it's covered, they get notified by an app, and they go out and, and uh, fix it. Or if um, somebody thinks there, there's, an, there's an animal in the nearby garbage can, they mention it on the website, and, the, and they go in and let the possum out. Um, th 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 those, <laughs> those, those are actual examples, right? Yeah. Um, and, those and, were examples um, from Boston in 20, 2011, yeah. And, and that kind of thing makes people more c comfortable with each other. But going from there to the big stuff, where, as you say, there yeah. are multiple databases, and, and you've got to get lots of people cooperating and, and interacting, that becomes more of a challenge. I think I would have thought 10 years ago that we would have gotten a little bit farther with this, but it is still pretty amazing how much it's grown. I mean, um, if, if, if our, our civic notion as a, you know, as, as a country is that it's by the people, uh, that we do this by the people, we're not doing as good a job as we should in 2017 of uh, letting people raise their hand and say, I want to work on this, um, and then giving them a good way to do that, whether that's um, getting data from their local government or federal government, any government, and making something of it, or figuring out how to help their neighbor. Um, but I think I'm also kind of amazed. So we had this uh, congress of our, our brigades, our local communities. We have 76 of them around the country. Miami was there in full. Uh, really showing off their great stuff around um, working with uh, Texas um, uh, after the hurricanes had sort of swept through the country and they had- Rebecca Monson, shout out, and Ernie, amazing. Ernie, shout out, yeah. Yeah, totally amazing. Julie Kramer, amazing. Uh, uh, Sketch City in Houston. So like Sketch City in Houston, our, as a Coach America Brigade, responded to, um, uh, responded to Hurricane Harvey, built a bunch of tools, a bunch of stuff, and then just like called up, you know, Miami. It was like, here you go. We have, I think, seven brigades in Florida. So they took them, and now that's sort of turning into stuff. So you, you actually had really on show amongst these 76 communities really concrete, visible, beautiful examples of people saying, it's, yeah, it's, it's, you know, I'm going to raise my hand. The other thing we say is we have. Where our, our favorite laptop sticker these days is, no one is coming, it is up to us, which I think is, um, which actually came from uh, Matt Weaver, who was on the healthcare.gov rescue. Um, but it is up to us, and we got to do a much better job in the next 10 years of making that us really aware of what we can all do together. Uh, and I think that bridges that, uh, I mean, it's always been, I think, the same community, but even tighter um, ties between the journalism community and that government community. In journalism, um, you know, we we talked about the downside of the web and how it destroyed the business model, and, um, but the upside is that there has been a revolution in journalism over the last um, maybe a little more than ten years, but certainly the the last ten years have, have been the, the <clears throat> most dynamic, um, where where. Technology has transformed journalism in a way that's just as profound as the invention of the telegraph, the photograph, the lithograph, 
radio, television, you name it. Um, uh, you know, I mean, my last year at the Wall Street Journal, um, we won the Public Service Pulitzer Prize um, for a story that it in, involved a, um, a, a significant amount of tech, and it also pissed off the tech industry. Um, uh, this was about backdating of options, and I, I won't, trust me, it was a, a a, f a fraudulent way uh, that that companies in Silicon Valley and elsewhere um, uh, used while competing to hire um, uh, folks, and they didn't really have to do it, um, but it was easy, and and they did it, and it went right up to um, uh, Steve Jobs, who was the one who called me up in London and chewed me out for f um, uh, f for 40 minutes, but. We were right, and um, uh, uh, the, the but to do that story, okay. Um, one of the things we had to show that was that um, uh, to do what these companies said they had done with their options would have required more good luck than a one dollar bet winning the mega bucks, and um, uh, I had a young reporter math major um, uh, who could write the equations, but I had to go in and beg the business side to use their servers to crunch the numbers for hours overnight you know, while they weren't using them. In those days, it would take me days or weeks, to, if I could do it at all, to do something that now a, a couple of people in the office will f not wait for some, a scribbler to ask them to do it. They will think of the story, and in um, half a day, they'll have it done. Um, b because there are now people that um, have, the have both the, the genes and the training to write code, and the genes and the trading to think about news. And that combination has meant that um, you can get databases crunched, you can get ideas for stories, all kinds of things that simply could not happen um, now happen because a 25-year-old coder is standing near the eleva elevator with two Pulitzer Prize-winning journalists, and the journalists say, we just can't scrape these, this data. It doesn't work. The, 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 the young man says, there's no data that I can't scrape. <laughs> and they, they go down. They get some sandwiches. They come back upstairs. And the, the data scraper discovers, well, this is harder than I thought, but I can do it. And they work together for a few weeks. And all of a sudden, they have an app that, um, that we call Dollars for Docs that um, uh, still delivers um, you know, anywhere from 1,000 to 10,000 page, page views a day. This is a revolution in impact for society. So, that, that so reminds me of Max Ogden in Boston City Hall, except for the part where he says, it's harder than I thought. Everything always seemed easier than I thought. <laughs> right. Manoush on Twitter just said, wow, this is more positive than I thought it was going to be. And so I'm going to pull in a couple yeah. questions that maybe will take us in a less positive way. <laughs> Because uh, along, you know, you guys are just the first of many. We got, but I, I want to ask you both about sort of the state of the industries from which you come over the last ten years and where things are. I mean, Paul, one question to you was, you know, what's, what do you think of the last ten years of the Wall Street Journal? I would push that. I would broaden that and say, ask for your sense of where traditional journalism newspapers have gone. And then, Jen, for you, I mean, partly thinking about the great work that Code Twenty Forty is doing, that we just mentioned. You know, you've been in the tech industry for a decade plus. How do you think we, we, they, are doing? Are you, you know, are we, are we on the on issues of equity and inclusion? Are we where you thought we would be today, ten years ago? You want me to speak for the tech industry? <laughs> well, can I decline? <laughs> Yes. I'll let Paul go first. <laughs> That's why I, I, think I anticipated that. I anticipated, which is why I coupled them together to give you a, a minute. Um, 
you, you know, the Wall Street Journal is um, uh, still one of the, um, you know, three or four or five best newspapers um, uh, in the in the country. It's um, uh, everybody has changed. Um, the the Wall Street Journal was well. I was still there. Um, uh, we had a visionary um, uh, CEO who said content has value, and and we charged for our content from the first day. It took uh, other people remember information wants to be free. Um, uh, sorry um, if if you can't get people to pay for advertising. Um, the only way you're going to be able to pay your reporters is if you can get them to pay for the content. So um, uh, there has been, um, at the national level, I think the combination of what um, the internet and faster and faster computers and phones and, and all of the other uh, changes in technology that has counterbalanced the hammering of the, uh, of the financial model. At <clears throat> uh, state and local, um, it's, uh, the negatives are way out uh, weighing the positives. Um, but I'm hopeful uh, that, uh, um, and, and optimistic that over time, we'll find a way to um, uh, support um, this kind of journalism at uh, the state and local level. This is why my uh, colleagues at um, uh, ProPublica have come up with the Illinois Project, which is a pilot to see if, if, if our model can work doing that kind of journalism. All right, now, thank you, Paul. Now you thank can bring us in on the time. state of the, Follow you can speak to the tech industry. Uh, yeah. <laughs> as much as you like. <laughs> I mean, I, I feel a little bit like it's unfair because we, you know, um, I, certainly the civic tech community is not perfect and not perfectly diverse in the way that it should be, but it is a, it is a little different from the tech industry at large. Certainly the numbers show that it's different. Um, uh, it's, it's just a, it's a more diverse community that's driven by, I would say, a set of values that are connected to the tech industry. They're sort of borrowing of the sort of ambition and optimism of the tech industry, but are really much more grounded in a sense of, um, well, we're talking about the name ProPublica and our, mm. our, um, our uh, tagline, you know, we, we reference for the people, by the people a lot in our work. Um, the really a, a different sense of the commons as being for everyone, not just sort of the commons that we've created in Facebook, et cetera. Mm. Um, it, there's just a, diff a little bit of a different set of values, so it's very hard to, um, I don't really know that I work in the tech industry. I feel like I work in a, in a slightly um, different, I'll say, um, um, corner of it that I really like um, and is not perfect either, but, um, I would, what I, one thing I would just say is that you know, when we talk about all of this stuff, and Paul was talking about you know, the, a chance encounter with a set of journalists and a, um, someone who knows data really well, I mean, all of this is happening because of human capital and connections and redefining roles. It's these hybrids, these people who didn't exist. They, they were, most of what gets done today in my world and I think in your world now is like, Certainly the job titles and job roles that we had before and the new job titles and new roles that didn't exist before. Mm. And they happen because we're bringing different communities together. So for me, it's all about the intersections of things. Um, it's all about um, not one thing and a different thing, but, but something new, like data journalism, like um, data, uh, um, design in government, whatever it is. And so we kind of feel like you have to build um, the human capital community for government that works in a digital age uh, in a way that matches the, 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 the country we're trying to govern. So um, uh, you know, we've made a big effort towards diversity. I think in the tech industry, it's still pretty um, bad, <laughs> I guess. We're still fighting a lot of fights that we should have fought a, a really a long time you ago. Bring us in for a really optimistic closing, and then you gave <laughs> us a dose of realism. A dose of realism. I, I, I have a I have a piece of op, optimism here. Um, uh, 
you know, I mean, here we have someone of the female persuasion who <laughs> knows from tech like crazy. Um, uh, you know, we both went to Yale. Knew you were going to get that in there. But, <laughs> but she got into, Jen got into the Bronx High School of Science, which <laughs> is, you know, no way could I have gotten into, could I have gotten into Bronx science. And I have, I have, um, I hope you're a new friend, but I have another friend, um, Jessica Lesson, oh, um, I who is, um, uh, was a, you know, a star reporter right off the Harvard Crimson for the journal, but then she left and started her own um, uh, expensive $400 a year uh, website called The Information. And one of the things that she did recently was to break the story. It's not, um, uh, you know, as colorful as Harvey Weinstein's uh, depredations, but a, about the, these, um, a couple of these uh, um, funders in Silicon Valley who would invite, there, there are now women with startups looking for funding. They invite the women to meet them um, at a hotel and they, they arrive and the desk clerk says, oh, you've got to call up to his room. And he says, I've got a suite. Um, uh, why don't you meet me at the suite? And um, you know, some women say, you're not on your life, dude. And, and, but others go up there and he you know, chases them around the desk. And, um, and if they don't do what he wants, they don't get any money. Um, uh, and he denied it, he threatened to sue, you know, all, all kinds of things like that. Did the story anyway, um, and... Uh, and this was before it came out in the Times. Jessica really, I think, broke that. Yes. She did a great job. Yes. Um, uh, now, you know, the, the, the Times stuff was spectacular. I mean, you know, get, getting, um, um, uh, breaking through the walls that Harvey had uh, set up, that was a tremendous bit of of um, uh, reporting, yep. but so was what Jessica did. It was um, uh, spectacular, and that set off a cascade of women coming forward in Silicon Valley. So, you know, on the one hand, it, it exposes a seamy underside of human nature, but the other thing is it shows that women are in two positions of power. They're doing startups, and they're in a position to expose the bad stuff right, that's that going was a on. Good Way to tie it back y'all in. Things Thank are changing. you guys so much. <laughs> I, we're going to step Thank aside you. now. Jennifer is going to lead us in the second conversation. So Thank you. Thank you guys both so much. <laughs>